Okay. So let me get through all of this stuff. So this talk is a three-act play. Um, I like I don't think think of it as chapters, like I like think of it as plays because you know I'm gonna talk about where is the C standard now. I'm gonna talk about what's parallelism, kind of a back history, walking you back of what we actually put in for C++ 11, 14, 17, and then a look ahead to see where we're going with, with, uh, with 20 and maybe what's coming in 23. Most of my life um, has been in parallelism. I'm still right at the beginning, so I want to talk to, you know, kind of look back to see where we've been before we look ahead to see where we're going. And then one question people have always asked is, is there actually a direction to C++? You know, is it intentional as to where we're going? Or is it kind of accidental? You might be surprised at the answer. On the other hand, you might actually know what the answer is. So let's start with what gets me up every morning, okay? And it's not my cat, actually. <laughs> Even though in here, it's actually, it looks like my cat gets me up every morning. Um, it's because it's really what gets me excited, okay? And what gets me excited is about efficiency plus plus and about efficient parallelism with the right amount of abstraction. So you might have seen this kind of slide where you know we've been, we now know we, we've had C11, 14, 17, and from the accumulation of all of these different um, standards, when when we wrote it, you didn't really know what was the you know, you know the nuts and bolts of how things work, but you didn't really know what, what were the, the, the specific rule, the, sorry, the guidelines and rules that you can summarize out of that. And it's only in retrospective, after you've had it for a while, that you begin to realize that these are, the, these are what comes out of those rules. So now, we now know that we do things like, you don't use any, you shouldn't use, use raw numbers as much as possible, you should use height rich programming that gives you um, that, that, that allows you to, to do things like unit programming if you have to. So you don't, you, you, you no, much, no longer just put a, a number two or number three, you know, in, in, in your assignment. If that's all possible, try to assign a unit to these things. And you can now do that with use user-defined literals. Um, I sum it up by saying, you know, no more raw food. You know, if before C++11, you had to declare. You shouldn't. You should try to use auto as much as possible. You, you were using, you were forced to use null and, and voice star zero. Nowadays, you should be using null quitter. Um, you were forced to use new and delete, and maybe you still need to for some specific reason. But before you do, try to think about using uh, unit, you know, you have these make unique pointers and make share pointers. These are now available, and they, they, they combine an RAII type and makes it easy for you to not forget about having to, having to specifically delete things. Other things that applies, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but um, one specific one to, to remember is that there used to be this rule of three, right? If you, if you have a constructor or a destructor, you should also do a copy, your, your, your copy constructor and your copy assignment constructor, right? Well, nowadays, that has been kind of been ex expanded, but also contracted. You know, on the one hand, you might need the rule five, which is that which says that you need a, a, a move a move constructor and a move assignment that adds two more, right? On the other hand, if you're using doing if you have a value type, the efficiency of C is that you actually don't need now to remember using any of these. Now it straights back down to rule zero, where you don't need any of these things now. So this becomes a lot more efficient in terms of how you do that. The other side of this is about parallelism. And in parallelism, we are also trying to create the right kind of abstractions. Um, and in this slide, which I've never shown before, I've been thinking about, you know, does C++ support all the right kind of parallelism at every level? Well, the, the, the short answer is it doesn't. If you're talking about cores and, and hardware threads, then you absolutely have support for that in C++ 11, 14, and 17. We have stood threads for that, and we have async. If you talk about vectors, we don't have that, and right now that's in uh, parallelism TS2. If you're talking about atomic fences, we have it scattered all over the place. There's some in, um, in, in the standards, there's some in the few TSs here and there. If you're talking about parallel loops, we start reaching out of band, out of C++, 
Um, so that you have to talk about using either parallel algorithms or for each. If you're talking about heterogeneous programming, there's nothing in C++ that explicitly support that. For that, you definitely have to go out of band outside of C++ and look at things like OpenCL for C, um, Sickle for C++, um, HSA is something from AMD, heterogeneous uh, systems architecture. It's not very popular, you know, AMD tends to make these, do these things really well but nobody follows it. I don't know that's what, I hate to say that, but you know, there's OpenMP and OpenACC. I actually charted that direction for, for five, five years of my life where we try to, where we push forward these target directives to support dispatch to GPUs. Um, you may or may not know that. There are also these um, US national lab languages, which are principally just for their use, and they're called Cocos and Raja. Okay. If you want to do um, distributed computing, well, there's pretty much well-known one is MPI, which stands for Message Passing Interface. Fairly clunky, old, almost 20, 20, 30, 30 year old interface. But there's actually stuff that is very C++ specific. Okay, probably the best one I would recommend is HPX. It's something you can download, it's free. It's from Louisiana State University, LSU, by my good friend, uh, Pablo Kaiser. And it does a really good job of being able to go millions of threads um, across many different CPU nodes. And he did it for, in, I think in, originally for astrophysics, but it could easily apply to most applications. <laughs> okay. We're actually trying to vary that with SQL so that we can create a kind of a combined heterogeneous and distributed system. Other things, like if you're doing caches, did you guys know that C17 has, a, has support for false caches for false sharing? It's called constructive and destructive interference, the hardware interference. Okay, some of you, some people may not know that. Um, for Numa, we don't really have anything yet, and we're working on things like executor. For TLS, we have something called now called execution agent local storage. We don't have it yet, um, but we're working on a proposal um, um, in in my group that's doing things like that. And certainly, at some point, we're going to have to support exception in a concurrent environment. Because right now, exceptions only work in a single threaded environment. It's not actually allowed to, to work. You can pass it from one thread to another thread, but you're not allowed to have multiple exceptions in play from different threads. Okay. So we're working on something called a reduction property where you can actually take these reduct these exceptions that are fly that are in flight from multiple threads and do a reduction on it so that each time you can reduce it by one. So that you can now slowly get it down so that by the time it percolates out, you only have one exception to deal with. You have to tell me which is the, the more important exception for two that I that, that I want to percolate out. Okay. So right now I'm going to show this slide again at the end of this talk and show you what we have for C20. Okay. So Starting going jumping right into app one. That was actually not app one, it was just sort of a preamble. Um, this is the ratification pictures for every um, standard that's been going along. Okay. Um, so 98, 11 in Madrid, 14 in Washington, um, Washington State, not Washington, DC, Essequah, and 17 in Kona, Hawaii. Anything you kind of noticed about the differences in all these pictures? Okay. I think I started showing up here, here. I don't even know why. Is this is anything you guys notice? <laughs> yes, the camera's better. <laughs> <laughs> the group's got on your head, obviously. First thing that people say the group's getting bigger and bigger. Yes. Um, C is absolutely popular in terms of the number of people showing up. I think here there were about 30 or 40. And when I started coming, which was about this boundary, it was like about 50 people every meeting. Nowadays, this is about 120. Now we're up to about 180 every meeting. And part of that is, I have to, I don't want to take credit for it, but have to be because of SG14. SG14 has been actively um, acting as an outreach where pretty much anyone can, you know, with some of these other study groups, you kind of have to be already in C++ to participate in it. SG14 is open to almost everyone. And as a result, we meet great people. You know, Renan's been on, Addy's been on. How many of you guys have been on SG14 calls? Okay. They are every month on Wednesdays, second Wednesdays, um, 2 to 4 Eastern time, which makes it 9 to 11 Israel time. Is that right? 
Okay, in the evening, yes. And what you know, what better things to do than to get on an SG fourteen C plus plus call before you go to bed? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, um, that's not the only reason. I think it's because C plus plus is getting popular, and the number of papers um, per meeting are absolutely staggering. Um, over one hundred and sixty to eighty papers. If even if it's there ten pages on average per paper. For paper, that's almost like over a thousand pages you have to read before you even show up this end of meeting. Now, in reality, we don't actually read all of them. I mean, I I kind of just I kind of I, I read deeply the papers I care about, and then I kind of just skim a few of the other ones, right? And that's really the best I can manage. So the end result is that you can see the comp the C plus plus um, standard committee comp is is getting more it's getting bigger. There are more study groups. Um, SG. We are now we now have um, SG19 for machine learning, SG20 <coughs> for education. This, edu this SG20 is specifically so that we can create a, 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 a curriculum where we can identify what are the dependencies from one to the next. How many of you guys are in a teaching or consulting capacity? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in that, get on with SG20. If you're interested in machine learning, Get on with me because I'm interested in that. What is that? This machine learning. Okay, so um, I now chair SG14, of course, and SG19, and I can't help but throw another cat picture. You can never help put throw enough cat pictures in talks. They they usually make the talk look nicer. Um, but I'm not the only one who's monetized monetized cat pictures. Who, who works for Google? <laughs> okay. Um, SG19, I initiated it because I felt a deep need after for the last three years working as a head of research for public play that I can study how machine learning worked in, in, in Python and R. And I noticed that, you know, I, you know, I've always wondered why is machine learning gravitated to those two languages. And I felt a deep need to try to um, make sure that C doesn't fall behind. So some of the things I noticed are things like the fact that in Python, it's a lot easier to pass data around from one package to another. Package dependencies are much clearer in Python. But those, those, are, those are just the surface, or the surface reasons. There are deeper reasons, like the fact that you need to be able to do things, iterate things much faster, and that Python can do those things, you know, doing, doing uh, easy iterations much easier. And the other thing is that, the, uh, you know, on deeper thought, we also need a way of extracting graph relationships out of C++. And that's fundamentally what some of these things that are deep learning and recurrent neural networks needs to do. And we think that we can, as a group, by gathering C++ experts with data scientists and machine learning experts um, who are now already on the call, we can do something like that. So join these guys if you want. You also notice now that these incubators, and part of that is the fact that we want to release the, the, uh, the normal groups from um, the, the fact that there's so many papers and that the fact that, so they can kind of do as an early gatekeeper on these papers and they can try to keep sending them back and say, well, this is just not good enough, can you come back? Whereas before they go to, before they go to the main committee. Okay, any other questions about these? Both of these groups now have external Google groups that you can join, okay? Just look at SG14. These are the three groups that have external Google groups. Essential, that's why it makes it easy. Just Google ISO CPE SG19 or SG20, you'll find them. Or go to ISO CPE.org and look for forms and you'll find them. So How am I doing? Yeah, go ahead. Embedded under, under low latency. Embedded has always been low latency. And that's why I'm extremely interested in Renan's proposal because I'm really supportive of, of, of embedded programming. Oh, by the way, please keep asking questions. Um, this is as interesting as you guys make it by asking me things. So stop me at any point, and you know later on you see some of the things, and I want to make sure that you guys stop and ask every clarification questions you can. Okay? Embedded is not only about the latency, so the, the, right. all the other aspects of the and all the other aspects. Yeah. So this group is not just low latency. It says its actual long name is low latency games embedded and financial. So what I do is, because that's such a big group, I have over 700 people signed up in that Google group. I've separated out so that each of those groups has, a, has, a, has a, what they call a special interest group chair. Okay, so that, that way I don't have to, um, I'm not an expert in all of these domains either, so I have to, I have, to have help. You know, so that's, that's what we do. 
Any questions, guys? Am I speaking too fast? Yep. Okay. This is real. I often feel I'm always so impressed that you guys all speak English so well. Whereas I can speak absolutely zero amount of Hebrew. Although I'm learning a lot by you having been here for a week now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, it's, 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 it's really fine. Fine. Okay. SG5 was my original. I resigned from SG5 and handed it to Hans Bohm. Um, and I'm sure that it will go really very well under him because he used to be SG1 chair. SG5 stuff, um, we, we produce a TS, um, you have, uh, uh, and that TS, the feedback from it actually told us that it wasn't right. Um, virtually nobody wanted to implement it. I mean, GCC had, it in, had most of it implemented even before the TS, so the most of the TS was kind of based on GCC. The other thing that's occurred in industry is that most of the hardware vendors are slowly backing off from the for transactional memory. But IBM has backed off, backed it off from their power system. Um, Intel no longer has it in their Xeon 5. Okay. That's kind of telling you, these guys are actually trying to tell you something. For a while there, transactional memory became a kind of a fad you know, this is a really cool thing we need to have. And indeed, for hardware vendors, it's actually easy, really easy to implement. And the whole reason I became chair is because, you know, I worked as an IBM research scientist for 25 years almost. And, you know, this was a, a, heavy, a leading direction for us. We had many researchers working on it. Over time, those researchers dwindled and dwindled, and you could kind of see the writing on the wall that, Whatever it was, just either didn't work or didn't sell, or it wasn't a big ticket item for customers to care about. I'll tell you, I'll stop for a moment and explain why uh, transactional memory is actually a really easy thing to add as a hardware support. For the most part, transactional memory um, is actually just really a very um, interesting um, cache system. The, the fact that when you have a when you have a cache memory, and then when when one thing is invalidated, the whole thing gets destroyed because of phone sharing. That's pretty much what the transactional uh, interaction is, right? So really, it was really, uh, you know, in order to make something transactional in hardware, you just have to have a kind of an extra bit to identify this instead of a cache line, it's actually a transactional line. And this line by line, I mean, um, how big the unit of transaction is, and each, each design um, determines that themselves. So, so as a result, it was fairly easy to add it in the IBM power and for Intel to add it. Unfortunately, you heard of the fiasco that Intel had suffered when they found that there was a fundamental flaw that someone else found it, and they had to back off an entire production line in the Haswell, okay, in order to fix it. But at the end of the day, I think both companies are finding that that's not quite yet, you know, it's not really helping anything at this point, so that's why um, so right now, the, that's the, the long suit to answer to that. I'm sorry about that. I had, I had to run on because there's so much to tell. But right now, what's happening with transactional memory is that they're backing off from the existing um, design to something much simpler, which is what they call transact lightweight transactional memory. What the, by that, I mean they're going to only track now just the memory reads and writes within a transactional block. What happened before was that in transactional blocks, they were tracking not just, we were tracking in the design, not just memory reads and writes, we would track all function calls. And what that does is now it creates a viral effect because if you have function calls inside your transactional block, they also must be transactional safe. And if they are transactional safe, things inside of them, anything they call must also transitively, also must be transactional safe. This creates a long chain of viral effects, and in implementation, that's actually not that easy to implement. Okay, so as a result, now we're saying, you know, forget all about that. Most of the time, people just you, you don't want to. You, most of these times, these blocks aren't being used in general situations anyway. Just use it for reads and writes, and then those you just want those things to be transactional. Makes sense, right? So maybe that that new that kind of new proposal will get through. Okay. Absolutely the right thing. Keep asking me questions as I go along. I know I know and, and remember lots of stuff, but I don't necessarily remember them while I'm talking. Okay. So this, you, you guys have probably all seen this before. I have no idea what that is there. Anyway, um, it's three, it's the it's C, it talks about the, the lifetime of C 98, C 11, and all the different um, specifications that are 
that are head TS that are heading in that direction. Um, C plus plus eleven had the um, TL, um, sorry, the, the TL one library, um, and, and then they broke up this thing called special math, which didn't get added until I think it was seventeen. <laughs> But, for, but, but anyway, C++ 17 had file system, library fundamentals, and parallelism 1, okay? Um, that, <coughs> this is what added the standard template library that allows you to be run in parallel and vectorized. Then there are, there are a whole bunch of other ones that are now trying to go into C++ 20. As of the latest report resulted from San Diego, which happened about a month ago, concepts have been, part of concurrency is in, ranges have been, all of these are still pending. And I'm gonna go into a little more detail on every one of these, and I'm hoping, I'm expecting you guys to really pepper me questions, specifics about what's in, which feature is not in or not, okay? So just to summarize, what's the best feature of C++ 17? We didn't get any of these, no concepts, no unified call syntax, no default comparison. This is supposed to be default comparisons, which are what otherwise as people call the spaceship operator, I like to call the TIE fighter operator. That's another picture that you can liberally sprinkle in, this, in the talks. It doesn't really hurt to talk much, but most people appreciate it. And then the, the, the most important things we got out of that, and there are other things, but for me, being a parallelism expert, I love the fact that we have parallel STL algorithm, but underneath there are these things called execution policy, thread of execution, and progress guarantees. That is actually some of the most important foundational things, and I'll explain what they are. Okay. So, from the C++, um, in terms of priorities, we wanted to have things like concepts. That's now in the working paper. We wanted things like modules that we're still trying to get in. We wanted ranges, that is now in. We wanted networking, which, which depended on executives. And we, we fixed the executive problem. We now have a executive light, a lightweight executor. But networking is being shut down because there's some issues with the fact that it's too big to be processed in one meeting, and it's a five-year specification. We're still fighting that fight. We're hoping to still try to push it in, but it's something that, that we're not entirely sure will, will, will be done. Concepts is in the standard library, that is done. And contracts is in, coroutines is not in. Okay. Uh, who cares about coroutines here? Wow, okay. Okay. Let's talk about coroutines in a moment when we get to it. Okay. So feature by feature, these are some of the biggies. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna go through them, but I think you'll get the slides anyway. And you can click on each one of these links and it will go to the actual paper. That'll be pretty useful. Um, I highlighted some of the ones that I care, that, that I think you should look at carefully. The fact that concept, so concepts, technical specifications um, was merged in C++ 20. The initial step only merged in the full syntax and did not have the uh, the, the term syntax, what they call AFT, the abbreviated, abbreviated function complex syntax. And I'll explain a little bit about that. And then we had we got the um, the, the spaceship operator, which gave you the um, the 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 not equal and the equal equal by default. Okay, and also also triple comparison as a result of that. Okay, now, and we had contracts which put in, that's important for, in my view, that's one of the more important ones for functional safety, okay? It gives you the ability to add preconditions and postconditions on a function. In my, my personal view, that's not enough. We still need things like invariance checking, but that's expensive from a runtime point of view, invariant checking, so we don't have that yet, but I'm hoping that we will. Um, in the most recent meeting, we finally completed the job of concepts by adding abbreviated function template syntax. In the library side, I don't really follow the library too much, but there are, there are a few things that's kind of important that kind of got in. Most importantly is, of course, the fact that standard library was conceptified. That's an important step because how are we expecting you guys to, to, to use concepts if we can't use it in the standard library? Okay. Um, 
And then probably the most significant in the recent meeting, in my view, is the fact that Rangers is now fully into C20. Rangers is a attempted replacement. I don't know if we will ever retire iterators, but it should completely replace iterators. And you, you're not sure why we want to do that. Iterators, fundamentally, it was a great idea of the 80s. It gives you a kind of a beginning, an open-ended range to the end. But it doesn't give you the ability for many other kinds of interesting patterns, like a circular pattern, for instance. And ranges give you um, more, more, a wider range of wider um, um, uh, range of support in those areas. So if I were to go back and look through the different C plus plus eleven projects, um, this is the you know this was pre pre C plus plus eleven. We had the technical report on C plus plus performance. We had the report on library extensions, all of this got added in, or not all of it, 13 out of 14 got added into C++11. The mass library got, in, got it started out and couldn't quite make C++11, but finally made it into C++17. And then there was this library on decimal floating point type, which didn't go anywhere with okay. that. Um, so let's talk about this stuff that did, is, is aiming for 20. So transactional memory, I already said that, it's not going to 20. We're trying to revamp it and make it much more lightweight. Um, concepts. So concepts, we've already said that we now merge all of it in, in terms of adding both the full syntax and the abbreviated syntax. Now, executives is a new form, is a form that is extremely important. What it gives you is a kind of what's called functional dispatch between different kinds of parallel constructs and different par different um, execution resources. These execution resources could be um, some SIMD thread, some GPU, maybe an OpenMP runtime or an OpenCL runtime, some, something that could be either heterogeneous or homogeneous. These parallel constructs could be maybe a parallel for, a for each or a parallel algorithm. And the thing is, if we didn't have executives, you would have to have an end by end explosion for every parallel construct, for every possible execution resource. This gives you a kind of a, it's almost exactly like the way iterators can give you a marrying of algorithms and containers, okay, by, by liberally switching between them, okay. Um, we now have executors, okay. Um, it was touch and go for a while because we've been developing it for about three or four years. I had it, I, I had started that facility, the starting of that group about three years ago because um, three groups were fighting amongst themselves and they weren't talking to each other. Sounds familiar. Yeah. And, uh, no. and then by the way, and then when we finally got those three groups came, came together and we were just about to publish the specification, one more group came in and said, oh, by the way, you didn't consider our use <laughs> And I'm like, oh God, <laughs> why didn't you show up earlier? Um, anybody here from Facebook? <laughs> I'm not going to blame anyone. So I, I actually think they brought in some good, good, good idea. Um, I'll explain that in a lot more detail. Coroutines. Anybody here interested in coroutines? On what's code? Wow. Okay. So what we got is that in the technical specification is what's called a Microsoft design. That is, it uses these uh, Microsoft await and resumable, and that's well tested through the Microsoft compiler. It's what's called the um, the stackless coroutines. It doesn't use the stack, or if it doesn't use the stack, it's got to use something. So it uses the heap. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the part of the problem with coroutine is that not a lot of people understand that, that kind of code. Um, there are competing, they're not competing designs, there are other designs called stackful coroutine, which uses the, the stack. That's a pure library design, whereas this uses um, um, language keywords. If you just use a pure library, the only way you can manipulate coroutines is to use the, the actual stack. Just a recap to what coroutines is. Um, if you're familiar with um, the way function works, function is single entry and maybe one or two exits at the, at the bottom. Coroutines essentially give you multiple entries, multiple exits. So at any point, you can suspend your, your, your function, go to a coroutine, and then return back 
and then suspend again, return back. And this suspend, suspend, resume, suspend, resume can be, can be stacked all the way down as much as you need. And Microsoft has tested this design with hundreds of these kinds of suspend resumes as deep a layer as you need. Okay, sounds exciting. If you're parallel uh, uh, programming um, um, aficionado, you'll, you'll like these kinds of things because it solves certain um, unnatural code inversion problems. However, the, the thing with the standard committee is that I would dare say about 70% of, of the people don't care about parallel programming. Okay. They care about things like all value references, um, class template argument deductions, um, structure binding concepts. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that, but for those, for many of those people, they are going to look at code and say, "This code just looks totally strange to me," and it does, right? And the answer, the result is that it makes it very easy for them to get sidetracked into something else of concern. So both in both times in the last two meetings, coroutine has come to the full committee. It's about ready to get voted in. And there was enough people that had raised some concerns and they vote and, and it got voted out. Now, coroutine is very important. I I absolutely supported going to C20. And we're gonna try again in the next meeting in Kona and try to put that on there. And hopefully by then enough people will, will be will be reversed to think that it's something that they should support. Okay. Reflection. How many people care about reflection? Okay, a lot more. I absolutely care about reflection. Um, but it won't make it for C20. The, there is no TS yet. We're just bounding the preliminary TS right now. And that means that if, if it's at this stage, there's no more runway left for C20. C20 is fundamentally only going to, um, is basically going to cut off in the next meeting. And, and that pretty much means that if you don't have a feature well on the way, you're not going to have enough um, runway. You're going to run out of runway before we cut off the delivery. Okay. Any questions about these guys? Yeah, I have focus. You focus for TS implementation of yeah. the reflection of TS. I don't. I don't need it in the standard. I just need the implementation. In the I need it too, but I haven't seen any either. You don't, there aren't any timetables that you can know. Um, I think once you get it to this level, then you will be able to start seeing TS implementations of that. But you're right. There isn't. There isn't any that I could. I could point you to. That is not reflection. It's related. So, so ask me the question about meta classes, which is, is it going in, right? Meta class is actually um, is an inch is a good proposal. It's an interesting proposal. Um, it's you know by by Herb Sutter. He's really good with his his stuff. The, the thing is that meta class is really only even now at its very early proposal stage. It hasn't even really gone through committee reviews. He has presented, Herb has presented it at various CPPCon talks, but he has been really good about, and of all people he, he would know, is that he doesn't want to sidetrack the committee's um, work towards C20 with something as big as meta classes. So as a result, um, he has not pushed this thing in front of the committee yet. It is in the queue, and we won't look at it, and, you know, most likely until, another, until two more meetings has passed. Once the crunch has passed, then we'll look at medical classes. Okay, yeah, next question. What is meta class? Okay, um, meta classes is, I mean, I'm not gonna go too deeply into it. There's actually a good talk on CPD card about it, but it gives you a way of creating a, um, um, a kind of a, a, a supervisory or um, um, a way of looking at different classes, you know, creating different um, class cutting concerns among different classes. It's actually much more complicated, much more in depth than that. But have a look at the CPP con talk by her, and you'll be able to get a better idea of it. Yeah. yeah. Another big issue is pattern matching. Do you pattern have matching. Any chance for any light version of it? In the last meeting, there was finally a discussion. In I can't remember which SG. I think it was actually one of the incubators where they started looking at various uh, this, um, pattern matching proposals. But obviously, that's not 
going to make it for C20. Other questions? All right. So with the other concepts, I just I, I, I didn't do one slide with, with a bit of code just to show you that you know if I, this was this was the compromise proposal. Um, this satisfied essentially um, all the people who didn't want to write the, the, the full full syntax with all with, with the with template angle bracket for a concept, but it also allowed people who who can identify this as actually a template. Okay, and they can identify this as an actual template because of the auto keyword in here, which tells you that there's a type reduction that's going to that, that's going to happen. So this is what's called the terse syntax or a concept. Okay, and this one now, and you can also put this concept on the return type as well as the variable, and you will also get full type deduction on the on the return type as well. So that way, people who know can know that hey, this satisfies the camp that says oh, now I can tell it's actually a template. <coughs> Okay. And also the canvas says, I don't have to write the, the template keyword. <laughs> okay, question. We haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. Okay. Next question. All right. All right. So after the San, San Diego meeting, we had more things that came in. Um, concurrency um, is a TS that's been around since 2016, January. And out of that group, the only thing that made it uh, latches, atomic share pointer, um, got merged in. Um, we held back futures. And so this is where you would have gotten a, the dot then continuation for futures. Now, so you might ask, why did we why did we hold it back? There was certainly a concern that this this future, which is based on the Microsoft futures. Um, design was not as was not enough. We wanted more. This future is essentially fundamentally a a single consumer, single producer future. We might want a multiple um, producer consumer future, and that's why this is not moving into C plus plus twenty. And the other reason is the dot end continuation. We think we can get that from the executors. The executors is supposed to have a two-way executors that would allow you to chain continuations. Now, the problem is that was the part that got ripped out in the compromise for executor light. Executor light would only have um, one-way executor, that's the fire and forget executor, and the bulk executors. That's what you want to do if you're on some NVIDIA uh, GPU and you want to fire it off. You might have one thread that fire off millions of threads. That's called a bulk execution. There was another one called two-way execution, which allows you to chain executions together like a dot then. Okay? And what happens is at the chaining point, you could, return, you could have return a value or an exception all the way down the chain. This was okay until well, Facebook came in and said, that's, that's the, the problem is you, do, you have to now tell me whether you're going to be able to return those values exception in an eager manner or a lazy manner. And they proved to us that a lazy return of these, these, these values and exception was a better way <coughs> of doing things. Understandable because, okay, because Facebook's model is mostly a distributed system that uses lazy, um, lazy executions. So that's why we took their experience and thought that it was something that we should follow and really listen to. So as a result, what's going to happen is, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is that with executors, we are going to push in single one way, fire and forget executors, bulk executors, and then take the two way and do that either as a TS or work, work, work with that, that design from Facebook so that we can put it into C++ 23. When we will have uh, coatings, we will still need the uh, uh, future then. What? So the question is, what happened with coroutines, and whether we still need future dot then? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Because it seems like a very similar uh, functionality. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, um, you could actually do some of it using coroutines, and. There has been paper that tries to, to, to simulate that kind of then that, that kind of then continuation of coroutine. But even but the problem is right now, coroutine is uncertain about making it. So we're not 
we're not even sure if uh, COVID team will, will get in yet. Sure. Yeah. As soon as, as we have COVID teams, yeah. it seems like a future, a future plan. And it's not necessary. Yes, yeah. I agree. That in fact, we might end up going that route and just go through COVID teams as well. Yeah. Good point. Good questions. Okay. Um, Library Fundamental TS2, that's already been merged in the C17. It's got things like source code information capture. The range TS, I already mentioned, that is now merged in. Is that yeah. only part of the range that the range V3 library that didn't get into the standard? So they originally it was separated in that. I wasn't sure. Right. So the ranges has two kinds of library. One is range V2, which was concept based. But because not many compilers have concept yet at that point, um, Eric Niebuhr wrote up range v3, which does not require concepts. Range v3 have things that have to do with, with memory and algorithms. Okay. And thank, and thankfully we were able to get almost all of it into it. Yeah. So originally I think the views weren't yeah. The views came in there. Yeah. So networking is a big one. So networking, um, after, yes, it's been around for a long time. It was published um, 20, that's not right, 2018, is it? I thought it was a lot earlier than that. Networking TS. I, anyway, um, it was published for a long time now. And what happened was that when executives came in, we wanted to mod, remodify networking to use executives to do this networking dispatch. That depended us on agreeing on an executor that we would admit in the C20, because that's just a complete dependency chain. We got executor, but in a lightweight form, which was still fine. And unfortunately, that delay cost us the ability to put networking in, because now we only have one meeting. So it's still uncertain about how we would do that. Modules. Okay. So it could stay in the TS? <laughs> could we use it in the TS with the executors? <laughs> okay, okay, so the question is, and if it stays in the TS, can we use it with executives? That, that really depends on the implementers, okay? If anybody implements the networking TS, and I don't think they will, if there's any implementation at all, it will still be very similar to the original networking TS. So you have to use it <laughs> without the executives. Okay, so sorry about that. That's why I really want to push that in, actually. Okay, any other questions about this? So this one is modules. This one's a big one. We want modules because it solves one of the biggest problems C++ has, which is known as the constant recompilation problem or long compile time problem. And it, it was a, the version one of modules um, um, was basically based on the Microsoft inclusion model. Now, in that model, it doesn't um, it doesn't take account of what to do with macros. Because the way Microsoft has designed it was that it assumes that you're not going to use it on legacy code. You would only use it on brand new code where there would be no macros. That turned out to be unsatisfactory for a large number of people. And so Google went, went off and did one using, and they call it modules version two, which allowed a transition path for legacy code. Okay, So what that meant is that we, you know, nothing in HEP seems to happen without some sort of drama. <laughs> so what happened was we were able to look at the two and we are now planning to try to merge that in the C20 in the next meeting. Okay. Numerics is interesting, it's still under development, so there's not much to say about it. <laughs> TS2 is another one that I've been working on. We're gonna try to start at um, we're going to start building it up, and obviously this is going to be <coughs> things like uh, log three hazard, log, more log three operations, hazard pointers, read copy updates, atomic views, and concurrent data structures. Parallelism TS2 is put is going to go into C plus plus twenty, and we're going to add things like task blocks, and this one here is important SIMD, which gives you finally the ability to do that abstract over many different types of vector data types, <clears throat> okay? Um, transactional memory TS2, when we finally get transactional memory light, we will put it in here. This one is about putting a, yeah, go ahead. The SMD, will there be any kind of structure to the 
There's abstractions about the width of the vector, and there's also the usual operations that, that's, that can associate with the SIMD operations. Okay, so most of it will be quite nice, and it will, it will finally allow you to not have to worry about specifically uh, what your vendor's uh, SIMD type is, whether it's AVX512, 256. I mean, I mean, Intel itself has eight, and it's not, they're not, it's not their fault, right? Every time you have a new SIMD type, you kind of have to, you kind of have to have additional um, capabilities. Intel, I mean, IBM also has like about five versions of of of, um, of all the back um, SIMD types. Right? Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Question: The ACU and the hazard pointers, the whole trade, it was a trade for the low latency and the SG14 type of work, not the mm -hmm. <laughs> Can they be separated as pushed uh, earlier, not as part of the concurrency APS? Okay, so the question is can we push, can we get a hazard pointer and RCU earlier, um, like into C20? Because they're very important for low latency. Yes. Yes, I totally agree. Um, I don't think so right now um, because they, I mean, they are. Actually, they, they've actually gone through full SG1 review and they're actually sitting at the door of library library work working with waiting for review. And because we haven't specified that that because we always said all along that it's targeting for it's a, for a TS, um, we would not need immediate review for the next meeting. Um, in case you guys don't know what it is, hazard point and RCU are very two very efficient techniques for log free programming, especially in the case of um, if you are doing, <laughs> doing read mostly and, and, and only very few updates and writes. And in those cases, um, the way these two, these two um, well, let's talk about how RCU works. You can have many holders that are holding read logs on something, and you might have somebody come in trying to do a write. And what happens is during a grace period, it will, find, it will, it will have a way of waiting until all your reads are, have, have been emptied out. So that you can actually update um, um, very efficiently okay? without any kind of, uh, of uh, conflicts um, or, or, or contention. And this is very this has been proven in in the, 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 the Linux kernel would also use significantly. Okay? Um, so the answer is, I don't think we'll be able to put it in any earlier than a TS. And there's also, because of its high complexity, there's a wish for people to see it as a TS first before it goes in. But I do agree with you, these things are not going to disturb anything by themselves because they're library, they're library functionalities. Okay. How much time do I have left? Um, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Go a little bit faster then. Maybe you can, if people don't mind, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, graphics TS. Uh, how many people care about having a basic graphic capability in C++? It's quite a lot. Um, but not that one. Why, why not that one? Because of the Cairo interface? When I looked at it last time, it was, it made all the API mistakes that I didn't like about that. Thank you. That's good feedback. We needed to know that. Um, it got withdrawn precisely because, but not for <laughs> that reason, for somewhat other kinds of reasons, where the people saw it saying, well, it's not advanced enough. And this is the kind of things that happen to standard committee. Um, the, the proposal goes along for a while, and then when it's getting, look like it's gonna go in, then people are gonna say, come up with all, some, you know, some other reasons why it shouldn't go in. Some of them is pretty valid, like you didn't consider my use case, I really needed to support it. Other ones can be somewhat disturbing, like, you know, um, it, it's not the goal that I want. Now, this is this package is mostly for basic graphing. Whether it should support higher forms of high performance 3D graphics and things like that, I don't really think it should. But you're right. One of the fun, one, uh, one of the valid complaints people have about it is that it uses what's called a stateful interface. Okay, and keeping state in a graphics interface has been known to be problematic for about a decade now. And that's why um, there was enough contention that we decided to shut it down. But it's coming back though. 
Um, SG13, I think it's going to try to revive it in some form so that we can effectively at some point have a 2D interface. Um, if you ever wanted to, if I can quote Biana, one of the things that he said, you know, when we were discussing is that all he wanted to do is somehow be able to just be able to draw a basic line graph, a basic surface graph, so that when you do C++, these are some of the things that a student might need from his teacher. Instead of reaching out to some other graphics package in order to get something like that, it would be great if that's in the C++ library so that you can just generate, and these days, especially with machine learning, Quite frequently, you just want to just be able to be able to draw some sort of minima for your linear for your linear um, algebra or your, your linear linear regression. So <laughs> you, you can't even do that in C plus plus simply, right? So that's one of the things without having to, to draw everything by, by you know having to build up this graphics package uh, from the ground up. What about basically learning to play? What about what? Is it included in the graphics here? So it's something. What about basic linear algebra? User interface buttons, uh, text boxes, uh, like uh, yeah, like user interfaces and things like that. Is it included in the graphics yes, or is it something different which was not considered yet? I don't think I don't think it's included, but I don't know for sure. I could be wrong there. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. So I'm finally getting to Act Two. <laughs> Which is fine. I mean, you guys have asked some excellent questions, but I want to go. Through, I can get into action fairly quickly. What, right now, what we have are these. What well, to support parallelism and concurrency, we have Central the Sun, which has the the core working groups, the library, and the evolution groups. And you also have SG one, which handles parallelism and concurrency. SG five for transactional memory, and SG fourteen for late low latency. Okay. Now. There are certainly there are certainly reasons why we started with some of these things. Even when we started back in um, two thousand and three, when I first started joining, that was pretty much when they when people first came and said, "Wouldn't it be great if C plus plus also support parallelism?" And we said, "Yes, we are we are we are crazy to have crazy about this feature. Can you guys work on it?" And we did. We had many meetings to to understand how we can uh, catch up. And even back then, we were just trying to catch up to the real world. By then, there was already multi-core processors all over the place, and yet we still C++ was still you know ten de you know a decade back without any parallel processing capabilities. And what it means is that we ended up getting um, separating out the feature <laughs> the core and the library. But in in effect, um, even some of the things that are in the library, like atomic types and operations, are actually in this library section. But it's it's implemented using a, a, a core language. This is because if you have a um, um, a machine type that uh, that is log tree, meaning like you have low link store conditional on power or compare swap on on x86, you would implement your atomic using those log tree types, and you would only be able to dispatch those if you dispatch them from the from the compiler, okay, not from the library. So. Conservatively, we would put some of these in the library in for the case that if your machine actually didn't have any log three types, okay, then you would have to use a library call to, to masquerade those things. I'm not going to go through this. This is just like a marketing slide that tells you what we got in C++. Yes, we got a low-level support. I can summarize by saying that what we were intending to build was essentially a a way of giving you enough basic tools so that you can build higher abstraction libraries. Okay, but unfortunately, we got something wrong along the way. Um, what we didn't get, and we're still trying to get, are more higher abstractions, and that include things like transactional memory, queues and counters. We're still trying to get core routines and networking. The red ones we are finally beginning to get. We never were able. We still haven't gotten distributed and heterogeneous. That's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Something called reactive programming, and it's totally the case that we never got compatibility between C and C plus plus. Okay. Yeah. You said you got some stuff wrong. Right? Async was one of the biggest things that we got wrong. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get to the next table. And still, um, the, what we got is that you you can still make mistakes with parallel programming. This doesn't help you in any particular. So one of the things that I want to talk, sorry about the blurry image, but one of the things that I want to talk, tell you about is 
what the what parallelism and concurrency features look like. And often it looks different depending on what words you use. You, some people might use words like um, like low latency or bandwidth or throughput. And I think if you're not in that business, you might find those terms are similar, somewhat similar. So I started drawing these kinds of charts where I started identifying separating them in terms of asynchronous agents, concurrent collections, and mutable shared states. And I now added a fourth column called heterogeneous and accelerated computing. Now, in just a short way to go through this is that asynchronous agent is basically things that can allow you to independently communicate using messages. So an example of that is just buoy background printing. Where if you want to print when, when you when you want to print something, you don't want your screen to lock up, right? You want to be able to continue to work. So a key metric there is responsiveness. If you have concurrent collections, this is the ability to operate on operate on a group of things, okay? A group of a, a, a large data structure using parallelism. So things like quick sorts, trees, and combinations are those examples. But the key metric there is throughputs and many constants scalability. When you have mutable shared state, this is the third concern for most um, parallel programs. And this is where you have a shared state. By shared state, I mean a global variable. But, you, but multiple threads can change it. So in that particular case, you definitely want to avoid race, race conditions. You want to be able to synchronize the objects in shared memory. And you will have things like um, um, log data and log free libraries and atomics. And the key metrics is log free and race free. Okay. When you have heterogeneous computing, you're now looking at offloading the GPUs, FPGA, some of the embedded AI processors of today. And now you're looking at being able to distribute offload. And the way, the, the way we do that is using things like um, reactive programming, pipelines, offload, target, dispatch. And the key metric there is independent forward progress, because you want the GPUs to be able to make independent progress. And load balancing, maybe sharing work between CPU and GPU. Unfortunately, before C11, none of this capability was in C. You for in agents, you could use things like POSIX threads, okay? Um, for concurrent collections, you could use things like OpenMP, maybe thread building block, or OpenCL. Um, for mutable shared state, you have to basically roll your own lock, okay? You couldn't really do it through C++. And for heterogeneous, you have to use CUDA or OpenCL. Now, as I walk through this, I'm building a table for every, um, every version of C++. You see that starting C11, we added things like threads and lambdas for asynchronous agents. For concurrent collections, we added things like async, package tasks, promise, and futures. Okay. Um, for mutable shared state, we have memory models and atomics. Now, I would still say that, that even though it wasn't specifically targeted for heterogeneous computing, lambdas is actually the the, the gate that we open to allow us to do offload computing. Because many of the modern C++ heterogeneous or distributed computing um, languages use lambdas as a way of throwing it to a GPU node. And this is because lambda has this interesting quality that if you have a value capture lambda, you have no strings attached to the original variable, and that allows you to essentially dispatch it. Async is interesting. It was created as a way of allowing you to build thread pools, hence the current collections. But it has this weird quality um, where it blocks when you try to get the value. Okay? It blocks on it blocks on destruction and it blocks on the get. Now, some people feel that this is the way it should work, but many people feel the opposite. And as a result, um, some people have now felt that this was a mistake. And the question is, will we be able to get something that is async too, which does not block on destruction and does not block on getting the value? And the answer is maybe not, because we can never retire an async. This is the bane of being in a standard. We think that we can potentially fix it using executives. Okay, and that's the direction we're going with. Just keep moving on so that we can get out of here in reasonable time. C uh, 14 is a minor release, and we didn't add a huge amount. We had more polymorphic lambda added, generic lambda. Um, we fixed a few things in terms of shear law and out of thin air. I'm not going to explain too much about that. Then it's going to get into a bunch of memory model things. Nothing really for heterogeneous. 
17 now, the big thing we added was parallel SPL. This gives you the ability to dispatch your SPL algorithm in parallel instead of just always sequentially and parallel vectorons. And the way it works is it uses this parameter called the execution policy. Okay, and we also had allowed you to control the false sharing. For mutable shared space, we added a bunch of things like scope blocks and shared view tanks. But the most important thing that I feel we added that helps is what's called progress guarantees, turn of execution, and execution policy. And these three actually are really important for C17 uh, for heterogeneous computing. I'll explain why. For a long time, the standard talks about standard threads, what they call stood threads. These are fundamentally heavyweight CPU threads. You know, they come with a full frame, a big stack. These are not GPU threads. In fact, you could not use them as GPU threads. GPU threads are typically lightweight, a very small stack, okay? Doesn't take up a whole frame. And without making this change, what we did was we changed these things called, these change from stood threads called thread of execution. And in such a way, now we could say, um, even though it's essentially a textual replacement, it was a very important change because now it enables us to be able to encapsulate the ideas that there are these execution agents that are lightweight instead of heavyweight threads. Even further, we add this execution policy, and this execution policy is from the parallel SQL, and I told you that it gives you uh, sequential, parallel, and parallel vectorized. It actually gives you a fourth one, which is an escape hatch. It's essentially a book called a vendor policy, where you, a vendor can say, for this particular policy, it could be something else. And you could now, using, using that escape hatch, build a, something that goes to the GPU, for instance. And that's where you can get heterogeneous capabilities. Okay? A couple of, one, two more slides to show you where we were, we were going for C20, and then two more final slides to show you what we're going with in terms of direction. For C20, many things are already in. Um, we think we now think that executive life is finally at a stage where everybody can vote and agree on it. There's also something called joinable threads, which is the idea that you know how the, the thread that we got from C11 has to be joined. If it doesn't, it's going to go it turn into a zombie when the program terminate. Now they have a they have a new type of thread, which is called jo joinable threads, J threads. Which may be called I threads at this point. I can't remember. You keep changing the name. These two letters are just too close for you to know which one they do say. There's also um, task. So we incorporated most of the, the, the parallelism TS2. So you see that sim D of T is now here. Um, under beautiful shear state, you're going to get the atomic shear pointer type, as well as atomic padding, semaphores, improving the memory model. Out of these, the most important ones that we that, that contributes to heterogeneous computing is atomic ref, um, multi-dimensional spins, and executors light. Now, I've already mentioned that executors is the, is the thing that marries different kinds of parallelism constructs with many different kinds of execution resource. So that way you don't get an end-to-end -end explosion, but everything goes through this executor and you can select the execution resource for any particular parallel algorithm. And this gives you a bifurcation where now we can talk about the idea that the executor has a context which manages execution resource, which then has an instance of some execution platform. But at the same time, they also have lightweight execution agents because now everything is a thread of execution, okay, which then have execute some instructions. <laughs> and then some the executor it's going to have an executive fu execute function that's going to create these lightweight agents. So that's the beauty with execution um, executives. Now, in 23, we think that if coroutine and networking doesn't make it, then it's going to make it by then. Um, there's definitely going to be a new form of features, new kind of features. And we might have things like concurrent vectors that allows you to operate on a group collection that's concurrently. Okay, um, we might have, um, by then we will have the hazard pointers and RCU. And right now for heterogeneous, we're working on things called affinity and pipelines and agent local storage, um, machine learning and AI. So that really gives you an idea, I think, of where these things are. I'm gonna skip past this. But let's talk about the final, the final act, which is, is there a direction for C++? 
So we wrote this as a, a group of directors wrote this document, P0939, getting Google on it. And here's the thing. Often, it's because people come in and says, I had this big idea, and I did that myself. I walked into the committee and says, I would like to change C++ to have heterogeneous capability. And the answer that came back was, thanks, but no thanks. And rightly so, because it would have caused a massive change to C++, and that would, could have caused major problems for a language that has millions of lines of code dependent on it. Imagine what I would have had to change if I wanted to do this. I probably would have had to change the, the memory model. I probably would have to change, from, change it from its current flat memory architecture to a multi-layer memory, memory addressing model. That would have killed almost every program that's already existing out there. So the answer that always comes back is try to do it incrementally, gradually. And only if that doesn't work, then come back and talk to us. So that's why I mean, that's why we have these, these features being added incrementally. Affinity gives you the ability to say, how close am I to a certain execution agent in terms of my, my, my agents and my data? Okay. So that's why we're doing it like that. Now, one other thing that you might not realize is that C++ design, and I've been there for 20 years now, they operate very much like um, Brownian motion. Um, it's almost like a reacher board where you have many hands pushing on this puck, and you really have no idea where this puck's gonna land, okay? You can see that there are many cooks there. This is from Zurich, and it has over 180 people, okay? So what they did was they created a direction group to respond to, to this, so that somebody at least can kind of say, well, we think that this is not part of the coherent direction. So when you saw that list of features early on that I showed, you see that there are many features there, some of it related, some of it not, and part of the reason is because they're championed by somebody who's pushing for that direction. And they're attending the standard committee. And if they're not attending, um, they, they're not going to be able to manage <coughs> So as far as I can tell, the direction group is created because I think these guys have been um, in there for, uh, for a long time and have shown a willingness to be fair in terms of their, their, their judgment of various proposals. And so I would say at this time, we have a good chance of trying to create a C++ with more coherent directions, and certainly uh, strengthen the pillars, which I, I call better support for modern hardware, and more expressive, simpler, and safer abstraction mechanisms. And to that end, the, the document actually has very concrete suggestions. You guys have mentioned things like pattern matching. Um, we want to have um, either, so now something that's been talked about right now in SG14 is the idea that maybe exception to be augmented with error, error return codes. So that for embedded computing, you don't have to just rely on it. And I kind of started um, noticing a difference there. Um, you know, if you want to just, just keep running um, at, um, and die, most of the time you don't actually need exception for that kind of thing. Um, static reflection, modern networking, modern hardware. And in that end, there's actually a specific statement that says we need better support for modern hardware through heterogeneous and distributed computing. And that's so, this is, this is a tally of where we are now with C20. We've got most of it, but except home routines is still not there. Okay. And actually, modules isn't exactly there either. They have to be merged yet. So I, I promised you that there's one slide that is going to go back to um, what we talked about in terms of what C++20 will or might give you. Um, for vectors, that's going to be supported in C++20, we hope. Atomics and uh, atomic fences, futures, counters, that will now be in C++20. We still are not going to have anything specific for parallel loops yet. Um, oh no, sorry, we've always had something for parallel with C++ 17 parallel algorithms and for each. Executors are going to run the parallel loops. That's right. Executors absolutely will run with parallel loops. In fact, they were designed for those. Okay. Um, so that's for executors. Uh, that's down here. Okay. Um, for distributed and heterogeneous, that's not going to make it, but we're working on affinity for that. For TLS and for exception handling, we're working on that. Okay. And with that, I would say I'm going to close with three things. If you have to only remember three things for parallelism, the idea is to find ways to expose more parallelism. 
You want to make sure that you find ways to increase your locality of reference. And even today, you can use heterogeneous C++ because there are many frameworks, including the one that I work on, but there are many other ones that actually already help you support modern C++. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to talk to Okay. Um, the question is about the vector parallelism, and I assume you mean there are two. Um, you don't mean the Cindy, the, the no. Cindy data. You mean you mean, you mean the the um, the, um, the callback. Okay. Um, so the parallel execute the STL um, so C plus plus seventy now gives you the ability to execute things in three ways. In addition to the escape hash, the sequential way, which is what you have now, parallel. Which is which gives you what's called um, parallel, or it's, it gives you um, an order within both within each thread. Okay, so that gives you parallelism. Then and, and then there's also what's called parallel vectorized, which actually you know, the actual word for it is parallel un unse unsequenced. What that means is you can all, you can execute it in parallel unordered within each thread, but also interleave now. Okay, this interleaving is what they call parallel unsequenced. Right. Other questions? Again, if you guys have any thoughts about um, any particular features, I, we, C++ now have all these open groups now, and I urge you to get on some of the calls, many, many of your colleagues have, and you can certainly get a feel of what kind of uh, climate and how people discuss these things. We're really no smarter than all, any of you guys, really. I mean, we've been there for a long time, but that's, like, that's really about it. And we really need your energy and your ingenuity to come in, come in. And especially in terms of the fact that you guys know your domain much better than we do. And if you guys come in and tell us what is, what is it that can help your domain, then we can definitely see um, if we can help you. And the purpose of something like SG14 is that we have committee people as well as non-committee people. And the committee people will proxy your proposal if SG14 agrees it's something to go on to. That's that we should go in. <laughs> And that way, uh, they can carry and run with the ball if you couldn't attend the standing committee. And we realize not everyone can, can you know, take three weeks off every, every year to attend these expensive, these very expensive meetings. And with that, thank you very much for having me, and thank you. <laughs>